seeds or transplants? That is the question. <laughs> Seeding the garden. If you choose to use seeds for your garden, it's great you can, you can use the best varieties, but you can also use some unique varieties. I love looking through seed catalogs. Do you guys like looking through the seed catalogs? There's some crazy things in there. You can get the purple carrots and the blue potatoes, and you can get radishes that are white on the inside and red on the outside instead of the other way around. Watermelon. And it's just, or it's watermelon. 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 watermelon too, and radishes. So it's Watermelon just, radish. Yeah. Well, that's what it's called, a watermelon radish? Okay. So fun stuff. Orange cauliflower. You can get really, really fun stuff in the seed catalog that you might not be able to find if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's or Walmart to get your plants, right? Um, so that's one advantage of have, um, using seeds. Some vegetables don't transplant very well, and that was the transplantability rating that I told you about. We're going to talk more about that. And also, seeds are inexpensive. You can get a lot of seeds cheap, but you know where they get you on the shipping if you're ordering from the seed catalog. So this is where you want to partner up with some of your neighbors and your friends and put in your seed order all together so you don't have to pay those ridiculous uh, fee, shipping fees. So transplantability rating. This is how well does the, does the plant go from the container, removed from the container, and how well does it transplant into your garden? So um, some plants prefer to be seeded directly where they're going to grow for the rest of their life, um, where others really don't care. So transplantability rating, those that easily survive, which means that you don't have to take much care moving them from their original container into your garden, include beets and cabbage, eggplant, lettuce, tomatoes, sweet potatoes. Those that you want to require care, meaning you, you want to be very gentle with the root system, that you don't want to damage it too much, Especially carrots, if you mess up that tap root of the carrot when you're transplanting it, you're going to have a crooked carrot. Oh, no. uh, carrot, celery, kurabis, <coughs> onion, mustard, spinach, those are all plants that you want to be careful when you move them from the container into the garden. And those that, this is containerized, but basically means that you want to seed it directly, it's where it's going to grow the rest of its life, or you might want to use one of those peat um, pots where that, that you can gently tear some of it away and use that so you don't disturb the roots. I include bean, corn, cucurbits, okra, radishes, turnips. They, they have, um, they can be a little more, mm, what's the word I'm looking for? Sticky <coughs> or they don't like much uh, change and if you disturb the roots too much or you cause too much stress on the plant as you're moving it from the container into the garden, they may not survive. And I've seen this happen a lot with cucumbers. Has anybody ever had trouble transplanting cucumbers from? Yeah, I see. I had see heads shaking. Now you know why. They they they. It's, a little, it's very stressful for them to be transplanted. Uh, so those you might want to try seeding directly in the garden or using a peat pellet or a peat pot uh, to plant the plants in. Those peat pellets work really good too. Everybody knows what a peat pellet is, right? No. Oh, we should have brought peat pals. Maybe I'll have to go over and grab one. There's these little compressed uh, discs of peat. You add water to them, and then they, the peat expands and grows, and you can seed directly into there. And so when the plant gets a couple inches tall, you can just take that and put that in the garden, and, and you won't disturb the, the roots. And the peat pots, or there's, there's peat that pots that you can, um, usually I take the bottom off and the ridge, but you can plant that entire pot into the soil, and it will degrade. Yes? Yeah. Um, can you do the same thing with core, that coconut core? Mm -hmm. So you can see yes. it in the core instead of in peat. You could, yes. What's a cucurbit? What is it? Oh, cucurbit? cucurbits are cucumber squash, watermelon, um, oh, it's cantaloupes, um, oh. zucchinis, oh. Um, all those. That family. <laughs> That's a good question. I Sorry, I forget. Yes? Celery, a lot of times, it's like back to super root bound. So I've always kind of tinkled it. Should we not be doing that with celery? Um, just have you ever have you had success with it growing after you did that, or you just I'm struggle? Just a little bit of time, maybe now and something like grows off on you, you know. But yeah, it's just you might have you might get a little bit of damage, but you just try to be careful, a little more careful with it. I would say, don't be so, don't rip too many of the roots. 
But you're right, pot bound is not a good, good thing to have either. Seed longevity. How many have seed packets they have no idea how old they are? <laughs> I say if you have them, plant them. What's, what's it going to hurt? They might come up, they might not come up. Didn't they find like a seed that dated back to like dinosaur years, like a couple years ago? You don't know. It could have, you could have, it could have been well preserved that it might grow. If it doesn't grow, don't get your heart broken because seeds do have a life. And some seeds are going to live only one to two years. Some seeds could live three to four years. Some could live for many, many years. Um, so there's a list there of how, how long they live. So if you have some that are older than that, you might want to think about you trying to plant them or just throwing them away. Seeds have an expiration date on the packet for a reason um, because the company guarantees you germination rates from that. In that package, don't they? Usually on the package it says like 90% germination rate, and if it goes, if they're too old, they can't guarantee that anymore if the seed packet expires. Yes? I was just going to say it's not for people to do if they have expired, because they do it for kids is um, do microgreens, because you're probably oh. some of the germination rate goes down, right? But mm -hmm. some of, a lot of them will germinate, so you're not wasting time with two or three little plants that rather, you know. That's true, yeah. That's why, I mean, a lot of stuff can be used with a microgreen, because you kind of really close together to so. Yeah, you could definitely use them as, as a microgreen. <laughs> you know, might as well just see if they grow. You yeah. have them. Where's the microgreens? You harvest, you harvest the greens when they're really tiny. Yeah. Oh. Um, so you can store your seeds. You want to make sure you store them in a cool location. The refrigerator is a great place to store your seeds. So if you have a little drawer that you can dedicate just to your seeds. Um, some seeds can even be frozen. Don't ask me which ones. I don't remember. But some seeds you can actually keep in the freezer. Uh, they don't like high moisture. So um, it doesn't matter here. But in Florida, I'd say don't keep them in the shed or the garage. But it's oh. Um, I guess it really doesn't matter here if you keep because it's going to be dry. Um, and you want to keep it in an absorbent material. Plastic bags are a good place to keep your seeds because they can contain moisture. So brown paper bags are best, or paper towels, something that can keep the moisture away from the seeds. Because if your seeds get wet, they're going to want to start to grow. And if they start growing, of course they're just going to end up dying or molding right there. So there are some rules to, to seeding your garden, and, and my rules might differ a little bit from your rules, but the, the general rule, and it tells you a little bit of, in your book about uh, how to plant seeds, but generally you don't want to plant them uh, any deeper than two times the diameter. So if you look at the bean seed in the photo here, it's about a quarter inch in diameter maybe, so you plant that how deep? Half inch, correct. What about lettuce seeds? <laughs> Barely. Barely. Those, the easiest thing for those, instead of trying to build like or make a little trough like this to plant your seeds in, I'd sprinkle them on top and then I'd take a handful of soil and sprinkle that on top of those seeds. That's easier than trying to make little holes. Because we want to plant thick. Why do we plant thick? Because not every seed may grow, right? So if you have poor germination or if you have old seeds, you always want to plant thick in hopes that every seed grows, but it may not. Um, and keep them moist. If, you're, if you let your seeds dry out, they're going to die. So you've got to keep them wet until, the, you know, until they start growing um, leaves and roots. Now when you plant, all those seeds, something might happen and they might all grow, right? <laughs> yeah. Now what are we talking about in the first half of the Spacing. session? <laughs> Spacing. <laughs> Are all those, to me, they, I think they're cucumber plants. Are all those cucumber plants going to grow an inch apart? No. no. I think cucumbers need about a foot apart, or 18 inches. So you're going to have to go through and thin them out. So thinning, oops, we thin for spacing. Um, you want to thin when the seedlings are small. If you thin when they get too big, their roots are going to be all entangled, and you're going to pull one up, and all of them are going to come up, and you're going to get frustrated. Yes? I'm sorry, can you go back just when you had burlap? Oh, <laughs> oh you can put bur burlap. Why would you 
You mean so you just keep checking it to see if anything yeah. kind of... Yeah, you can put burlap on it. Um, yeah, but once it starts emerging, you've got to take the burlap off. Yeah. And burlap will also keep the birds from eating your seeds. Yeah. yeah. Huh. And you can water through the burlap. Uh, so you want to do it when they're small, because if they get too big, like I said, the roots are going to be intertwined, and you pull one up, you're going to pull all of them up. Um, use a little plastic knife or spoon to dig out the ones. It's kind of easy to do instead of just pick them up, picking them. Um, if you are going to transplant the, the plant, or you are going to use it for um, sprouts, you can actually go in with scissors and just go and snip, snip, snip on the ones you don't, you don't want. I know that's hard. It's master gardeners <laughs> to kill plants, right? <laughs> How easy is that? Yeah. <laughs> Question? No. I was going to ask what you just said. Oh, okay. You, know, you just snip them. Just snip them. So you don't just Microgreens. Yeah. So let's say you can eat them as microgreens. Let's say that. Um, so if these are cucumbers that you want 12 inches apart, let's say we like this guy. So we're going to keep. We're going to. It's survival of the fittest in the garden. So you're going to look for the healthiest plant, and you're going to remove the ones that are within that are not within 12 inches. So you, if you keep this guy here, let me go to the larger picture. You keep like this guy here because he's nice and big. Uh, then 12, any plant within 12 inches to the next plant, you're going to remove. Well, let's say we go in 12 inches and we get to this little guy. We don't really like him. Well, if it's 11 inches apart, one inch isn't going to be <laughs> the death of the plant. So you want to try to keep the spacing as close to what's recommended. Mm -hmm. But if it's off just a tad, it's no big deal. Because you really want to keep the healthiest plants. So if you are transplanting them, you could dig them up with a little plastic spoon or, uh, and, and move them to another location. But always check the transplantability rate, too, because if it doesn't transplant well, don't waste your time. Jennifer, yes. not all microgreens are edible. Some could be poisonous. They right? are. They are, yeah. So you got to make sure that it is a microgreen that you can eat, correct? Can cucumber microgreens be... I do not know that. I do not know. If you, yeah, don't eat tomato microgreens. Yeah. Um, and I don't know about cucumbers. No, probably not. But beans and beans and um, lettuces and, and a lot of those, those type of greens. Let's say you don't want to you don't want to um, seed. You'd rather use transplants. The definition of transplants, I take two ways. One is that you're going to the garden center and you're buying plants that are already four to six weeks old. That's a transplant. So somebody else is growing the seed for you. You can also grow your own transplants. So you're growing your own transplants that are growing on the side, not actually in your garden. A lot of times you might do this to get an early start on the season. So maybe the season says it starts in August. Well, well if I put my, start my seeds in July, I can get a month jump start on the season, I'll just grow them in a, an area that's a little cooler, uh, maybe a little bit shadier that the plants can survive for a few weeks until they until we put them out in the full sun. Uh, so you can help avoid some of the bad weather by doing that. Um, with transplants, if you plant a lot of seeds, or if you go to the garden center, you can choose the best ones. Which is it's so hard for me to buy plants at the garden center, because I'll look at every single plant and maybe leave with nothing because I'm so picky. Um, you have instant success. You plant your garden with transplants, there's already something green growing, um, which equals ideal seed germination. But some plants, like sweet potatoes and strawberries, require to be grown by a transplant uh, or a cutting from the mother plant. They don't grow well from seed. Uh, sweet potatoes, don't. you're not going to get a good production from seed of, of sweet potato. You want to grow it from a cutting of a mother plant. And strawberries, the seeds on strawberries, most of them are viable. Uh, so you, you take a, the baby plant, you know, have you guys ever grown strawberries before, right? So that's, you take a cutting from the strawberry plant to have uh, strawberries. If you are growing your own transplants, be creative with your containers. You can go out and buy those fancy little seeding trays with the little pea pellets in it, individuals. Or you can save your yogurt containers and your milk cartons and uh, all anything that can hold soil, egg cartons. Some people will start seeds in egg cartons. Uh, you can save those and use use them for to grow your transplants. So just make sure you put a hole in the bottom for drainage. So your plants should be four to six weeks old when you transplant them into the garden. Be careful not to disturb the roots. Uh, we want to be gentle with our plants. 
Um, set them in a moist soil. If you take a transplant that's been fed all, it's nice and wet, and you put it in a dry garden, what's going to happen? The soil is going to wick, the dry soil is going to wick all the moisture away from that, from the, around the root, from the transplant with all, uh, and away from the roots. Uh, so make sure that you're going to have to be out there watering an empty garden. And your neighbors might think you're strange, but you're doing that to, to help prevent that wicking. Um, set at the proper depths. Most of that time it's going to be the same level that they were in their container. Um, but what plants or plant can you grow? Can you plant deeper? Tomatoes. You guys are good. Yes, tomatoes. You take out the take off the lower leaves of the tomato and plant where you take those leaves off at the node. Plant that underground. And tomatoes have this neat characteristic where they can grow roots from that node that you've taken off the lower leaves of. And so it gives the, the tomatoes a faster, bigger root system. <clears throat> And then you can start fertilizing with a liquid fertilizer, water-soluble fertilizer, right away. Yes? With transplants um, and hardening your plants before you plant them out? Hardening, yes. You, you, um, the question was, do you want to harden your transplants um, before you stick them out? And it depends where you're growing them. So if you're growing them in kind of a shady location um, until you stick them out into the full sun, you might want to gradually introduce them to the sun. You don't want to take them if they're growing in a, in a shady location, in a greenhouse, on the side of the house in the shade, and then you put them out in the full sun right away, they could burn. So you might need to harden them off and, and gradually put them in the sun for a few weeks or days. Yes? So let's say you're starting them in a, a garage where temperature fluctuates. I was thinking that maybe hardening isn't necessary because you it do have that be. wide range of Yeah, it might not be if you're getting the temperature. But, if you're, but it's the sun that I would be concerned about too. Uh, too much sun? So yes. if it has artificial lighting, If you have hours, artificial lighting, that might, that, that would, that would be, that would help. Like if you're starting uh, seeds inside. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so just the thoughts of fluctuating temperatures since at night it cools down. And right. I mean that fluctuating so. temperature definitely helps with hardening off. So what is the hardening actually? Hardening off is kind of, it gradually gets the plant used to either a certain temperature or to the sunlight. Okay. So I'd be more concerned about the sunlight as far as <coughs> um, taking things. But if you have grow lights, then that's going to be, right. you're going to be used to this, that sun. You can plant a, a tray with 100 transplants, but you're not going to put 100 plants in your uh, garden. So you, you can have the choice of which ones that you want to plant, and then you can give the other transplants away to your, to your friends. So let's talk about caring for the garden. Another pretty, looks like beans and tomatoes and some squash up front here. No water, no garden, right? Your garden is going to need water. The smaller the plants, they're going to need less water more frequently. But as the plant root system grows, as the plants grow bigger, they're going to need more water less frequently. And the reason is, when they're small, the roots are only the roots are so small that they don't have access to a lot of water. They only have access to the water that's around the roots. But as they grow, the root system is going to grow larger. They'll have access to water deeper into the soil and, and water all around them too. So. The smaller they are, less water, more frequent. The larger they are, more water, less frequent. Does that make sense to everybody? You can water your garden with handheld cans or a hose. A lot of people, uh, that's very relaxing to me, watering plants mm -hmm. with a hose, right? It's just, it take, but it, the problem is it takes time. And a lot of people don't have the time to water their garden. So you could use overhead sprinklers or you could use drip irrigation. Here's some pictures. Here's someone that's watering their garden. Uh, this is very efficient use of water because you're putting the water directly where you want the water to go, but it's not um, time efficient. Here's a sprinkler system. This is very time efficient, but it's not very water efficient. Because if it's windy, that water is going all over the place. That grass looks really good, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of water. <laughs> Drip systems, although they can look very intimidating, they aren't. They are very, they can be water and time efficient. Um, you're not out there watering with a hose and the water is going directly where you want it to go onto the plants. 
Uh, you can get starter kits at the garden centers for about $30, a little drip irrigation starter <laughs> sets. And some people will start with that and they'll get so um, excited and involved with drip irrigation. It can be a really fun, fun thing to try. And you can put timers up to the system too. So it just hooks up to your hose bib, put a timer on it, and it will water as you need it. And there's so many different um, little drips that you can get for the plants. So soaker hosers are very similar to that too, but not as fun. <laughs> Does anybody have drip irrigation? That Oh, you guys all know about it then. No, but can I say, yes. in the weather that we've been having, <laughs> the problem I have with our, we have it on a timer mm -hmm. with our irrigation system is that like in February when we've got the garden, when we've got everything turned down, suddenly you get 95 degree weather. So I supplementally hand water. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can always do the combination too, right? But it's still fun to play with the drip irrigation. And it's, it's movable too, so you can move it with your garden. Mm. It's great for landscapes too. If you can put it where you're establishing plants, and once your plants are established, <laughs> you can turn it off and move it someplace else. Um, water early in the day. Um, water twice a day if necessary. if necessary. If you are experiencing leaf disease on your plants, you want to make sure you water only the roots. The leaves of the plant don't need water. It's the roots that take up the water. And so a lot of times, uh, if you're watering overhead irrigation, getting the leaves wet, sometimes you might see leaf spots, some, some types of fungus on the leaves. If so, just start watering um, at the roots. Keep the leaves as dry as you can. Weeds. <laughs> Weeds need to be taken out of the garden, unfortunately. They are going to compete with your plants for space, for fertilizer, for water. So you need to take them out. That's, I think this is the least favorite part of vegetable gardening is, is weeding. It's really hard. And, and your only real option, if you have weeds growing, is pulling them out by hand. Uh, you could hoe them out, but that's still by hand. It's still mechanical, removing the, the plants. You can use mulch. Mulch will suppress the weeds. Uh, you need to make sure that you use at least three inches of mulch to get that benefit of suppressing the weeds. Mulch is also great because it's going to help retain moisture in your soil. Um, so mulch is always uh, always used in a vegetable garden, but definitely can be used. Uh, you don't want to go out there with a the roundup to try to get out the weeds during the season. I say that, but some people will start spraying, and then the drop of roundup gets on their tomato plant, and then their tomato plant dies. And uh, So you want to be really careful with that. Um, if you do have a lawn around your vegetable garden, I would refrain from using weed and feed products around your, in that lawn around your vegetable garden. Because the weed part of weed and feed is an herbicide and it kills broadleaf plants, which are your most of your vegetables. So um, I've seen where people spill into their vegetable garden and then that, they have damage on their plants. If you're using compost, if you make your own compost, make sure you don't compost perennials or weeds that are in seed, or you have little plants growing up. Um, and the hardest thing is if you have an off-season in your garden, make sure you use a cover crop or keep it weed-free during the off-season, because the worst thing is going out there in the spring when it's time to plant and your garden is full of weeds. That's not fun. So try to keep it weed-free. Put a tarp over it, some plastic, or a cover crop, because that will help. So mulch. Mulch retains the soil moisture. Of course, we just talked about reducing weeds. It moderates the soil temperature. It keeps the soil warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And as your fruit is growing, if you have a fruit that grows and has contact with the ground, like your cucumbers, your squash, watermelon, if it's, if it's touching the mulch instead of the soil, you'll have less uh, soil disease uh, or other diseases that, could, that come from the soil. <laughs> Some of the mulches that you want to use in your vegetable garden, you can use any of these. I call these inorganic, but they're really a process because some of them are organic. But um, organic mulches, hay, pine straw, leaves, large wood chips, yard waste, sawdust, peanut hulls. Um, sawdust takes a very, very long time to degrade in the garden. So if you use sawdust, don't expect it to start breaking down and adding good stuff to your soil right away. It's very slow. So is peanut. Uh, halls. Um, through your walkways, use plastic, newspaper, cardboard, carpet upside down, old carpet, but put the blue side up. 
Um, that could be that's great through your walkways, but don't use that around your plants because it will prevent the water and the nutrients from getting to the roots. But if you just needed a place to keep the weed free when you're walking through, that's great to use. <coughs> As your plants grow, you are going to stake need to stake them. So whether it be with a trellis on the fence, those <coughs> fancy tomato cages you can buy. Uh, plant to plant, like we talked about the corn as the bean stalk, it's kind of neat. But you are going to have to support a lot of them as they grow. Uh, you can buy those, those tomato cages or you can make your own. Um, I like to talk a lot about problems in the garden. Do you guys experience a lot of problems in your vegetable garden? Yes. 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 Rabbits. Rabbits. And I probably don't have all the problems because um, I'm still learning all the problems in California, but we, we can have a share session because we might have some time for having a share session. Yes. Yes. That's using pressure treated wood anywhere in the vegetable garden? Or raised beds? I think the research does not. And I have to check on this, but I don't think the research has proven that you can't use them. Well, I think in California they've changed the requirements. Yeah. You used to use arsenic in the wood. Now I think it's a copper sulfate. Right. It's not, as, it's not as toxic. Right. But you also should not use sawdust from pressure-treated wood as your mulch. Oh, right. Good point. Yes. What is, uh, I saw the organic mulch. It said pine straw. I've heard of straw, but not. Oh, that. that's a Florida. Oops. We use uh, pine straw. Is the leaves? Where am I going? Pine straw is the the pine leaves that fall to the ground. The needles, the pine needles. Oh, okay. And so they rake it up, and they. Bale it, and they sell it for like four or five dollars a bale, and that's great to use in the in the garden. I have a question about that. Do you guys have pine trees in your? If you have pine trees in, in your yard, just rake up those pine needles, and they they work great for a mulch. Especially if you have very alkaline. I mean, it doesn't. It takes years to take an alkaline soil and turn it into acidic, but so it's not really going to affect that. But it's free mulch if you have pine trees. And, that's what I was going to ask. Was yeah. I only use it on my acid-loving plants because back when I did my composting class through Solana Center, they said it puts too much acid if you if you compost with pine needles. Um, That's why you always do a pH test too if you're composting with it to see what the pH would be. But it would take it would take a lot of pine needles to change your soil pH to make it acidic. That's, good to know. That's what pine straw is. The hay, hay, you can go to the local farm store and buy a bale of hay. Sometimes, the, I, I know some master gardeners in Florida that would just go where, at the, go to, um, do you guys have tractor supply stores out there? They go to tractor supply and rake up all the pine, or all the hay that fell and take that home. Because tractor supply didn't care and they would use that in the garden so they didn't have to actually buy a bale of hay. Yes. You're better off with straw because straw. it has so much seed. Yeah. yeah. Straw rather than hay. Yes. Leaves. What about eucalyptus leaves? Yeah, leaves can be used. I don't know what the what the oils would do. Some plants are sensitive. Oh, some plants are sensitive to it. So then you might want to stay away from them, as, because vegetable plants are, so, are very tender. So. Yes. The problem with eucalyptus seeds is that they have oil on them, so the water cannot mm -hmm. penetrate through them. And so the semi-eucalyptus seeds are fine and big piles of it, nothing's going to go yeah. So oak leaves work well. Yeah, oaks. Yes. Leaves take a long time, no matter what you're talking about. But um, I have to share this because after 40 years, I finally bought myself for something under $100. That shreds my leaves. It's, oh. the, it, it's a vac it vacuum. It's a blower yep. vacuum. I don't believe in blower machines, but it vacuums them, has a bag, shreds them. There's a zipper on the bottom, so my shredded leaves are now my mulch, and it's the best thing Perfect. I did for myself. Where'd you get it? A Toro on Amazon. Toro, I think Black and Decker might make one too. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, you talking about the leaf blower shredder? That yes. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
whatever machine and whatever you want to call it, basically it's like a vacuum that sucks up the leaves and then it mulches it for you, shreds it, puts it in a bag, and it probably it fills it up in like 10 seconds though, the bag. So then you empty the bag out and you can use that as a mulch. And, and with composting, which I'm sure you'll learn this afternoon, the smaller the particles, the faster it's going to decompose. Yeah, right. well, so that's Gabe, Gene, you can use that thing two ways. You can actually use it to blow leaves, mm -hmm. and you can also use it to vacuum and shred. And you don't necessarily need the bag, because a friend of mine that has a whole bunch of avocado, oh, I just run through there yeah. and just and it just spits it out in little pieces. There you go. Like, if, 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 yeah, if you're standing <laughs> where you're, yeah. Um, I would just blow my oak leaves into my landscape beds as my mulch. Yeah, right. Because I don't want to rake it. Yes. How about using rice hulls? Rice hulls? I don't see a problem with Where using rice hulls. Yeah. Or a green and green yeah. store. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Real cheap. Yeah. Real cheap. Uh, the only I. Uh, it was I grew up, I grew up in, in Hershey, Pennsylvania, so they used to sell the the cocoa bean as mulch, but then dogs would eat it yeah. and die. So, <laughs> so then they stopped doing that, I guess. But um, because I guess dogs are allergic to chocolate and cocoa, so that was the best mulch because it smelled like chocolate. You're fancy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Jen, the book mentioned alfalfa meal. Alfalfa meal? What is that and where do you get alfalfa meal? And the other thing is straw. California has a number of rodentia. We are we are rodent county. And the straw is really, I mean, the, the creatures are pretty Yeah, the, straws, like the, the straw, so straw is going to um, <coughs> invite, encourage uh, the habitat. Habitat, yeah. yeah. yeah they'll take it. <laughs> but, but, but the alfalfa, does it work? Well, you have rodent control coming up soon, so, <laughs> so if you take that with your vegetable gardening knowledge and put them together, then you should help. But I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm glad we have. Alfalfa meal. Yeah. Where do you get that? Is I don't know where you get that. Frangettos. The feed stores. Oh, feed stores? The feed stores. Also. So it's like al it's alfalfa plants that they turn into mulch. Like rabbit feed. Rabbit feed. In fact, you know you buy it in bales, just kind of like no, it's a bag. Hydroponic bags. The hydroponic stores. For <laughs> the feed. One other thing. Yes. If you are going to use straw, and we happen to have rain, sometimes you can put your name with the feed stores because once their straw gets wet, they can't sell it for stables anymore, and then they'll sell it to you really cheap. Just to get it off the lot. Mm -hmm. There you go. Did everybody hear that? No. Go to the farm stores if you want straw. Give them your name because if their rains, if their straw gets wet, they can't sell it for feed anymore. So or you can, for the horse stables. Or for the horse stables. So they will um, sell it to you at a discounted price. What about coffee grounds? Be careful with coffee grounds because they will increase the acidity of, around, of the soil mm -hmm. and of the acidity of the acidity of the plants. So you can use that lightly, but if you're a heavy coffee drinker, drinker and you're putting coffee grounds out there every day, it might be too much. So just just sprinkle it lightly, compost it lightly. Starbucks will give away their coffee right. grounds for right. free, um, but you don't want that many of it, that much of it in your around your plants. Yes. Is that the same for like green tea leaves? I would say it would be probably similar for Catherine's green tea leaves, but um, you know, be reasonable. Just don't have a pile of them stick around all your plants. Okay. <laughs> and just another interesting source of it's not this. I don't know if it's mulch. I guess it is, but it's used on hops. Use hops. Mm -hmm. Hops. Hops. And we've been with these for a lot more now. Yes. Cool. Uh, here. So then go to the breweries <laughs> and ask them for their hops. <laughs> <laughs> then your garden will really smell good. Yeah. And one other caution. I inadvertently went to Starbucks, got coffee ground, just went out and sprinkled too. them around and burned my hands. Oh. Mm -hmm. Wear your gloves. Oh wow! The acidity, right? Because the acidity in the coffee grounds after I spread the big right. bucket all of them all over, by the time I went in to wash what? my hands, my hands were burned. Uh -huh. wow. And you get the filters also. So when you're dumping them, it's like well, the that. filters are. If you're composting it, that's fine because the filters are paper and they should compost. Right. But just tacky. <laughs> not, not in your garden. You just want. Yeah. They'll dry out. <laughs> 
Um, let's talk about some garden pests. I'm sure you have a few more um, that we talk about. But some pests in the garden include climatic effects. Um, temperature is a huge factor uh, in the garden. Rain, too much or lack of. Uh, humidity, too much or lack of. Light, too much, and wind, uh, usually too much, right? Um, so your best thing to do as far as temperature is plant during the right season. That's an easy way to try to offset that. You know, we can't guarantee it because you could have a 95 degrees in, in January you know, that we're not expecting that happens. Or you could have 20 degrees in, in November that you weren't expecting. So, but we try to do our best as far as planting to the calendar. Um, you can start, like I said, we talked about starting your transplants inside or in the garage. That's a great way to try to offset some of those climatic effects. Um, one thing you, uh, with your cool season or your cool season crops, some of them can bolt. Um, bolting is what, like I mentioned earlier, is when they produce a seed flowers and a seed head, and it turns the edible portion of the plant very bitter. Um, so, some of you, if it gets too warm for the cool season crops, they can bolt. Yes. Talk about having too much light because early on you said eight hours of sunlight minimum. And how do you have that too much light? You can have too much light. Um, if plants are getting too much light, sometimes they won't. They'll kind of be stubby. They won't. If they're getting too less light, they'll be they'll stretch to the light. But if they're getting too much light, sometimes they can be stubby and off color. So it is possible for them to have too much light. But usually, I mean, you don't use that too much in vegetable gardens. Usually, that's with more. Um, shade loving plants that can get too much light, but it, it can be possible. Or sometimes, if we have a cloudy day and all of a sudden a burst of sun comes out, you can the, sun, the leaves can get burnt pretty quickly if, if there's sun and temperature changes that quickly. I have a follow on question. They also sell shade cover mm -hmm. that says it's like it can be 40% uh, abatement of, of the sunlight. <clears throat> at what point does the plants need full sunlight? And at what point should you minimize it through one of these shade covers? That's a good question. That, that also goes with the length of the, the days, too. So you could use the shade cloth more um, in the summertime when your days are a lot longer because you're still getting that long period of sun versus in the wintertime is a time you wouldn't want to have any shade cloth because your days are so short anyway and the sun is less intense. Now, the t as far as the plant needs, is there as their age, if their age, I, I don't know. Usually, when they're small, they can take a little more shade, but as they mature, they're going to need more sun. Yes. My brother uses that shade cloth to um, shade his broccoli plants so that he can grow broccoli year round. Huh. So that that's one where you keep kind of keep, by shading it, you're keeping it a little cooler under the shade cloth too. You're still getting the light, the light because you're, the length of the day you're getting the light amount needed, um, but you're keeping it cooler that you can grow those cool season crops longer. So I'm bolting. Um, Draw the picture. Okay. Yeah, if I'm paying really close attention, and I see it just starting. If you pinch all that off, is that you might be able to catch it? Yeah, too early. If you're starting to see it to flower, but technically, when you see it, it's just it's just the beginning of the end of the plant anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Oh, like I noticed, like parsley will try to do that. I'll just pinch oh yeah, well, yeah, parsley is a little different. So okay. you definitely with any of your herbs, you always want to pinch all the flowers off. So this is bolting for some of your your. Um, you know, your, your cauliflower, your broccoli, and your, well not cauliflower, broccoli, I'm sorry, with your cabbage and your lettuces and your, um, some of your uh, greens, Swiss chards. Question in the back? Yes. What quality of reflective light on your vegetable garden mm -hmm. um, as opposed to full sunlight? Or is it, in, or I guess Indirect. reflective light or reflective heat? So if you plant on the south side facing of your home and you have the house also mm -hmm. reflecting, can you kind of it, it's, it's the actual sun rays that they, they need, not the reflective light. The reflective light, if it's too much, could cause harm on the, on the plant. If it, if it, get, it could get too, too hot on them. Because um, remember, plants will grow up to 95 degrees, so if it gets hotter than 95 degrees from that reflective heat, reflective light, that's not going to be 
healthy for them, um, but they want that direct sunlight, not indirect sunlight, direct sunlight from the rays so they can photosynthesize. Remember, you guys remember that word, right? <laughs> Seventh grade? Um, yes. Jennifer? Yes. At one either general meeting or in this class, somebody uh, was talking about, and one of the speakers said, when you use that mylar uh -huh. as a type of a mulch, that the reflective light discourages the insects that from the underside of the leaves, oh, which is it, where they normally hide. Uh, it does. Is it general yeah. meeting or one of our Silver, we call it like yeah. silver mulch. Yeah. Um, silver mulch will repel, I think, aphids a lot and maybe some white fly. Will it? So it's true. I don't know how it's going to do on as far as the heat but it, yeah. factor with the plants, um, but also it could affect, I don't know how, if you're going to just use mylar, how that's going to affect watering your plant exactly. though too. So, but, it's, but silver mulch is used, if you have a drip irrigation, you can use silver mulch, right? Yeah. So it's drip irrigation is going to be underneath your mulch. Yeah. Right. If you're watering by hand or a sprinkler system, you wouldn't be able to use that type no. of mulch. But it does reflect it does reflect the um, some of the the white fly and the aphids. Yes. Okay. What yes. Is silver mulch. Um, silver mulch, like he said, it's like it's um, mylar, um, which is uh, the silver <laughs> sheeting. Like what you make balloons out of. You make balloons out of. Use it if you're a racer. You use it to keep warm. You probably can buy it from a farm store, I guess. Walmart has it? You know, they can buy like a small amount, like just like one of those blankets, probably just really cheap. Yeah, a lot of them might be in your first aid kits in your car that you can take out. And <laughs> it's supposed to keep you warm, but you know, if your car breaks down, later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is that when we way off topic? Is that kind of what? Yeah. That was cool. <laughs> um, frost protection. Um, again, plant during the right season. You might mulch helps. We talked about hardening off. If it gradually gets cold, your plants can be more adaptable. And but if it suddenly gets cold, they're not going to um, may, may not be able to sustain the temperature change. Uh, mobile containers, if you grow up containers, you can always move them in the garage to help with frost. Um, some people would just put um, sheets over your plants to protect them. I like the strawberry uh, row strawberries here. They have the, the PVC pipe, and then if it gets cold, they just take a sheet from one end and just cover the entire um, planting. Tomato blossom drop. I don't know if you guys experience that here. It's very yes. common. Yeah, yes. it's um, common in the summertime mostly um, when it gets too hot out for the tomatoes, and then they the, they won't set fruit, and then the the, the flowers drop. Does it have to do with calcium too? No, calcium is usually blossom and rot, which we'll cover. But this is usually um, a temperature induced when it gets just too hot. Uh, if you keep your plants alive, once it cools off, they'll, they'll just bounce back into the things and start producing fruit again. Here's, here's a sunburn. So you know squash and zucchini, they have these big leaves for a reason, to shade their, their fruit. So for some reason, the canopy of this plant started to drop off, and so the zucchini got sunburned. But it's still edible. But if you were a farmer, you would, it'd be hard to sell that. <laughs> it was just ready to pick too, right? Yeah. Oh. Has anybody ever tried to grow your cucurbits? So remember, cucurbits are a cucumber squash, zucchini, watermelon, um, cantaloupe, uh, and your little fruit will get about this big and then die. Yes. <laughs> Happens a lot. And that's called lack of pollination. So if, you, if you're noticing that in your garden, that means you do not have enough bees in your garden. So now we encourage you to become a beekeeper, a backyard beekeeper. <laughs> and we'll be having classes probably coming up soon. But, um, or you can be the bee. So if you choose to be the bee, what you need to do is you find a female flower. The female flower has the fruit, whoops, has the fruit attached to it. See this little baby squash? At the end of the squash is the flower. That's how you tell it's a female. The male flower just has a stem. It does not have the fruit. Sometimes you'll have a lot of male flowers in the beginning when your plant's young, 
but eventually you'll get the female flowers. So if this starts to rot from the end, from the flower end backwards, it wasn't pollinated. Oh. So you need to either encourage bees to come to your yard by planting more flower, flowering plants around, or you can uh, pollinate yourself. So to pollinate, you take the male flower. Some people are very precise with this. So they'll go take little test tubes with the little <laughs> paint brushes, and they'll collect all the pollen and then they'll go over to the female flower with the paintbrush and they'll put it in, in the female flower. I just cut off the flower, <laughs> rip off the petals, <laughs> expose the pollen, go over to the female flower and go tap, tap, and have the pollen fall in, right? That's, that's the easiest thing to do. You don't have to be that precise. The bees are not that precise. So once you, when you pollinate, then your squash, your zucchini, whatever, will continue to grow. So that's, you'll get calls like that, like my squash are dying and they're getting only about two inches long and then they die. That's because it's lack of pollination. Jennifer? Yes? You can, I do that with my tomatoes, but not by taking the flower. When I go to the tomato cage, I bang the tomato cage to increase the pollinization of the flower for the... Right. <clears throat> right, because... Um, because... <laughs> the the flower on the tomato plant has is, is different than the than the flowers on the cucurbits. Um, this is it. We'll, we'll kind of go, but you have this on the slide set. This shows if your plants are hungry, this is what they're going to look like. Uh, most important thing: if you have iron deficiency, you have intervenal yellowing. Um, if you have potassium deficiency, you have leaf browning, which could also look like a water problem. So a lot of your nutritional deficiencies can look like water problems too. This is iron deficiency, intervenal yellowing, in between the veins. Sometimes that's a pH problem. Sometimes it's lack of, lack of iron. Here's calci uh, blossom end rot from calcium deficiency on tomatoes. Now calci uh, blossom end rot can also be caused by insufficient watering or, in or inconsistent. Sorry, inconsistent watering. So if it dries out, gets wet, dries out, get wet, you can get this too. Or it can be lack of calcium on your tomatoes. Insects, real quick. Um, you have your soil borne insects, ants, cutworms, white grubs. They can do damage to underground plant parts. You have chewing insects. You guys haven't done entomology yet, but chewing insects have mandibles like we do and they chew holes into things. So if you have holes in your plants, it could be a worm or a caterpillar, a beetle. A weevil, a grasshopper, could also be snails. Go back to the grub worm, Jen. That's the cut grub worm. worm. A grub? Yeah. How do you get rid of those suckers? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, that's a hard one. one. That's a really hard one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how to get rid of the grubs? I had one year oh. in big ones, and we put all the grubs in the bird feeder. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to get rid of grubs. It's, um, what about grasshoppers? Grasshoppers, the easiest thing with grasshoppers is to collect them when they're little. So keep a bucket so you water around and, and you collect them when they're little. Because like, they're usually, when they're little, they're in colonies, it seems like. And you can just pick up a couple of them and just throw them in the bucket so you water. Or just step on them. But once they get big, <laughs> they're really hard to kill when they're big. Cause you try to catch them and they just uh, yeah. they jump and fly like uh -huh. so fast. They'll leave a leg behind. But yeah, you can play games uh -huh. and try to catch them with butterfly nets or something, but grasshoppers are generalists. They eat everything. I don't know if you guys have Mexican bean beetles, but they can look, they are in camouflage. They look like ladybugs. Oh, These are the larva and this is the adult. Then you have piercing sucking insects. Piercing sucking insects have a straw-like mouth part that they insert into a leaf and they suck the juices out. Um, a lot of the piercing sucking insects also excrete honeydew. Honeydew. Um, and which on honeydew grows sooty mold. I don't know if we talked about sooty yes. mold, but sooty mold is a non pathogenic fungus. It doesn't cause harm to the plants, but it's a sign that you have the piercing sucking insects. So these are all piercing sucking insects. There's some aphids. Aphids come in all colors black, blue, green, red, yellow. Um, this is what happens when you have white flies on your squash. Is they suck this chlorophyll out of the plant, causing the silvering effect. <laughs> but then we have good guys in the, in the garden. So keep a, 
keep an eye out for these good guys. <laughs> Spiders are good. <laughs> Except for the black widows and the brown widows and the brown recluses, but all other spiders are good. So if you have some jumping spiders, you have some crab spiders or whatever spiders in your garden, let them be. They're eating all the bad bugs in your garden. This is a <laughs> tomato hornworms. Bad bug, right? So, so here's a tomato hornworm. Look, it's brown because it's dying because it was parasitized. A parasitic wasp came and she laid eggs oh, in the back. And those are the cocoons wow. that are feeding off the caterpillar. So if you see a caterpillar with caterpillars on the back, don't kill it because there's good bugs already killing it for you. And you want them all to hatch into new bugs. Wow. Oh, Can we wow. get one of those guys? Here's a, this is a, when we say parasitic wasps, don't think like the big wasps that are going to come sting you. This is a parasitic wasp about the size of a gnat. It parasitizes aphids. It just picked up this aphid, and, and she's wow. laying an egg inside that aphid right now. Yay! Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, and if you see, and if you see aphids, and you see brown ones with holes in their back, that was parasitized. We call yeah. that an aphid mummy because <laughs> they swell up and they die, and then the the new wasp will emerge out from the back of the aphid, leaving a hole, and that's an aphid mummy. Wow. So then we have slugs, snails, ants, squeak miners. But to manage insects, time you the planting. I gave you that example from the jail. Scout and hand pick. Those tomato hornworms, pick them off and step on them or throw them in a bucket of soapy water. You know, it's so much easier to pick off the caterpillars rather than, oh, let me go get my BT and mix it up and spray. And by that time, you can't even find the caterpillar anymore because it moved on. Um, Keep an eye out for the beneficial guys. There's also beneficial fungi out there that can attack white flies. Your soaps, insecticidal soaps, horticultural oils, BT and neem are all considered organic pesticides, but remember organic doesn't mean safe. Follow the directions. Neem can be a pretty harsh chemical on some of your tender vegetable plants. Um, we also have chemical insecticides. If you choose to use a chemical insecticide, make sure it is labeled for vegetable plants. Please, because it sounds crazy, but there's so many people who just go into their garage, oh, this kills insects, and it's their lawn chemicals. Don't put lawn chemicals on your vegetable plants. <laughs> and also look for varieties that are resistant. When you buy that seed packet, a lot of them will say resistant to dot, 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 dot. So if you buy some vegetables that are resistant to some of these insects and diseases, that really helps you out. I'm really out of time, so just real, so oh, there's oh, nematode oh, damage. Has anybody ever seen nematodes? Yeah. So nematodes are um, unsegmented roundworms that feed on the roots of the plants and they cause the roots to swell so the roots can't take up water and nutrients anymore. Uh, they're really, you can't see them with the unaided eye. Uh, going the wrong way. This is how you solarize your soil if you want, need to get rid of nematodes. Nematodes love sandy soils and you solarize it. Um, remove all of it. You have all this online, but Basically, bake your soil, mm -hmm. sterilize it, bake it for four to six weeks in the summertime, and that will kill nematodes, but it'll also kill everything else in your soil. Uh, so you just have, you basically, it's sterile. Um, then we have diseases, tomato wilt disease, probably the worst on tomatoes. There's uh, like a late blight and an early blight that your tomatoes can get. Basically, this is a heart attack for the tomato because it hardens the, hardens the vascular tissue of the tomato so it can't take the water nutrients anymore. And there's really nothing you can do about it. Rust is a fungus. Uh, rust can be easily controlled with a fungicide. Um, viruses are the prettiest of all diseases. Um, you can still eat that. It's just if you were a farmer, you couldn't sell it. But um, viruses could, can kill plants. Sometimes they just distort plants a little bit. It all depends on the plant and the virus. Viruses are spread by insects. Uh, aphids and white fly are your primary virus spreading insects. Um, so always use pesticides safely, follow the label, the label is the law, um, very important to remember that. And what I really want to stress is the application intervals, if it says apply every seven to, day, seven to ten days, wait seven to ten days to reapply. Also, I want to stress, we'll use unlisted crops, but also the harvest times. It will say on those, on those pesticides, do not apply two weeks before harvest. So if you plan on picking your vegetables that week, don't put a pest, the pesticide label says to wait two weeks before you harvest, then don't put that pesticide on. 
So a lot of people miss that step in their vegetables, uh, in their pesticides. This is when you get your weed and feed a little too close to your vegetable garden. And then we have all the other guys, animal pests in the garden. <laughs> really, not much you can do. Um, Neve is coming in a couple weeks to talk about this, so she can help. Uh, she's our, our vertebrae pest person, specialist advisor that can help you out. But basically, fencing and trapping are going to be your top two ways to get rid of these here. <laughs> Netting for your berries. Or scarecrow. <laughs> Any questions? I'm out of time, but. Good question. The caterpillar yeah. parasite and the other parasites that are friendly, good parasites, are they just naturally there for lucky, or can we find them and buy them? The question was about parasites, uh, uh, beneficial insects. Can you buy them? Are they naturally there? A lot of them are naturally here, um, but you can buy them. I would never, ever buy ladybugs, though. I would never buy anything that flies. Okay. So if you buy adult ladybugs, you put them out, they're flying away. So things that you would want to buy, I, if you really wanted to buy a beneficial insect, first of all, you have to have insects for them to eat in your garden. Mm -hmm. Second, um, I would uh, I would buy green lacewing larvae. Would probably be their best option. The green lacewings like white flies. They like aphids. They like a lot of those soft-bodied insects. And you buy them. The larvae. Sometimes you buy the them as eggs. But you should buy the, buy the larva. Um, in this cardboard container, and they're all in their own separate little cells because they'll eat each other if you, oh, cool. if they're all. <laughs> so, oh, and you just kind of peel back and you tap them out and let them be. But they don't have wings yet, but they'll turn into green lace wings eventually, which are adults, which are good too. But the larva um, will probably be the best to buy. On the uh, on the count of three, let's all say thank you, Jenny. One, ah, two, three. Yeah.